Welcome to the Sci-Fi 2021 CyberNorms panel, Firebreaks and Firewalls, Rules of Engagement for Cyberspace. My name is Andreas Kuhn. I'm a senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation America, and it's my pleasure to serve as the panel's moderator. Let me briefly introduce our diverse and distinguished speakers. All of them have worked for many years on ICT, international security, peace and stability, and each of them brings a unique regional perspective to our conversation. Ambassador Haley Tirmaklar is Estonia's first ambassador at large for cyber diplomacy. John Riles joins us from Berlin, where he is the head of the cyber policy coordination staff at the German Federal Foreign Office. Mudihi Makumane, based in Pretoria, is with Unidir's security and technology program, but will speak on this panel in her former capacity as a South Africa cyber diplomat. Elina Noor is Director of Political Security Affairs at the Asia Society, Society Policy Institute. She joins us from Washington, D.C. Bruce McConnell, a dear friend and colleague, is a distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation America and the former president and CEO of the East-West Institute. He's based uh, in sunny California. As you can see, the panel is rich of knowledge and experience in all matters of cyber norms and international cyber cooperation. Welcome everyone and thank you for being with us today. Let me start with observing that despite important progress on cyber norms and responsible state behavior in cyberspace, as illustrated by the successful completion of two consensus reports at the UNGGE and the Open Ended work Working Group earlier this year, malicious acts in cyberspace continue to be on the rise in terms of scale and scope. Are cyber norms failing to be the firebreaks and firewalls that keep tensions in check? build trust and prevent cyber conflict from escalating. I would like to get a sense from the panel about the current state of cyber norms. Elina, turning to you first, what is the state of cyber norms from your regional point of view? So let me offer three observations in three minutes. First, I think think region is in an encouraging place right now. Part of it has been a result of long running efforts by ASEAN as a grouping. Part of it has to do with Singapore's leadership in Southeast Asia on the issue, uh, particularly since 2018 when it was chairing ASEAN. And part of it has to do with the impetus provided by the UN, OEWG and GGE processes themselves. Despite initial concerns by some Southeast Asian countries about these, what were what was thought as parallel UN processes, Southeast Asian states were eventually pleased with um, how both processes complemented rather than competed with each other. The OEWG in particular allowed Southeast Asian countries who never had the opportunity to be a part of the GGE process to be involved in all kinds of cyber related conversations that don't generally get discussed enough in Southeast Asia itself. Thailand, for example, spoke of how the OEWG presented a historic opportunity for all states to engage within the UN framework on cybersecurity and to develop common understanding and areas of divergences among states. The Philippines considered the work of the OEWG itself as a CBM, a, a, conf a confidence building measure. Um, and Malaysia, which has been a part of the UNGGE, stated that the OEWG has surely increased the comfort level of all who participated, um, including on issues of divergence. Second, these UN processes individually and together have acted as a complementary platform for Southeast Asian countries to further their own regional efforts through ASEAN. Uh, there have been capacity building initiatives in the policy and technical spaces conducted intra-regionally, as well as with partners from outside Southeast Asia through, for example, the ASEAN Singapore Cyber Capacity Building Center of Excellence, as well as the ASEAN Japan Cyber Security Capacity Building Center. Following the 2015 GGE consensus document outlining the 11 norms of responsible state behavior, which we all know so well, um, ASEAN countries have also begun implementing these norms and keeping track of that progress against a checklist. There's also now recently announced uh, earlier this month an ASEAN Regional Action Plan, which will guide regional norms implementation due to be endorsed at the ASEAN Digital Ministers meeting next month. Third and finally, while there have been achievements in norms awareness raising, uh, even oper operationalization, there remain doubts, questions, reservations about the application of international law in cyberspace. 
as we know, there was a slight deviation in treatment of this issue in the OEWG and the GGE. Um, but moving forward, I think there will, be need, there will be a need for greater discussion within the ASEAN region on how Southeast Asian countries should or could interpret and apply different provisions of the UN Charter, for example, in the cyber context. And this would also fall in line with the same conclusion reached by states within the OEWG process. Thank you, Edina, for this really interesting and, and, and wide-ranging overview. Modi, I'd like to go next. Uh, what is the current state of norms in Africa and what are the maybe regional sentiments to their practical relevance? Thank you so much, Andreas, for inviting me. And it's good that I'm coming after Elena's um, profile of the ASEAN. What we have in the African continent led by the African Union as our regional body is what I call an emerging appreciation of the threats that are in cyberspace. Um, the discussions that took place in the UN Open-Ended Working Group and the UNGGE stretched um, the African Union's appreciation of the issue beyond what we have in Agenda 2063, which is the continent's aspirational program for peace and security and economic development. However, when you look at what the continent currently has, um, there is evidence that there has been a, a fundamental level appreciation of the issues that come with digitization. So, for instance, you will find in the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection, the convention seems to be very much in line with nine of the 11 voluntary norms that came out of the UN group of, of experts. And the only thing that it really falls short on is with regards to attribution mechanisms, as well as the setting up of computer emergency response systems. And then the second point is when you also look at the African Union Digital Strategy 2020-2030, there's this appreciation of the vulnerability of the continent and the member states to cyber attacks. It doesn't define what a cyber attack is, but there's definitely an appreciation of that and this desire to want to have a digitally enabled socioeconomic continent um, while also taking into consideration the vulnerabilities and risks that come with that. And then thirdly, to tie it all together, because the discussions were taking place in the first committee, which is a peace and security committee, um, we've also had to look at what the African Union has in terms of peace and security. And you find something out of the African peace and security architecture under what we call strategic security, an appreciation also of the emerging threat of, um, of cybersecurity and cyber crimes. And that all ties it together. And what, what the African Union um, is fundamentally about is that zones of peace tend to be zones of prosperity. And so that's how we, we've all tied it together. However, there is still a very low awareness of the norms themselves and how individual member states or even what we call regional economic communities implement those norms. So there is a bit, there are some regional economic communities that are running far ahead of others. Um, and also there isn't a, a holistic or comprehensive appreciation of the issue at the AU level that takes into consideration the peace and security aspects as well as the socioeconomic aspects of it. Thank you, Modi. This was, was quite interesting uh, to kind of see how those different pieces are, are coming coming together. Uh, Bruce, uh, what are your thoughts on how norms have developed since you led the co-secretariat of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace, which released an important report in 2019 that, that filled the void while the UN process was paused? Thank you, Andreas, and thank you for uh, to ORF for inviting me to this panel. Uh, Norms, in my view, can be defined as practices which become normalized over time. They are what people will expect uh, to happen. For example, there's a norm that people should cover their mouth when they sneeze. In most international domains, norms emerge first and are later codified into rules or treaties or laws. Under that definition, one can say now that among the major global powers, one emerging norm of state behavior 
is conducting continuous cyber operations on their competitors' networks below the threshold of armed conflict. Conventional approaches to defense in cyberspace have proven ineffective. Nations have learned that offense wins, and accordingly they have abandoned conventional theories of deterrence developed and honed during the Cold War. This practice means that cyber forces disrupt or halt malicious cyber activity at its source and persistently contest such activity in day-to-day -day competition. The base goal of these tactics is to reduce the effects of malicious cyber campaigns to make them internet inconsequential over time. As a result, military forces operating in the interconnected global domain of cyberspace are in constant contact with their competitors' sources of power. There are no national boundaries. Code itself is terrain, and most nations' networks exist essentially everywhere, intertwined with their competitors' networks. These tactics are conducted by all competitors unreservedly in defense of their own national interests, and the interests of allies and partners may not be fully aligned with those of the major power. Unfortunately, there are many problems with this approach. Across the world, in smaller countries and particularly in non-aligned nations, strong concerns are being voiced over the increasing militarization of cyberspace and the potential for further escalation of the cyber arms race. The current approach raises concerns about being caught in the middle of major cyber power competition and forced to choose sides. In general, there's a lack of transparency about the nature and extent of persistent engagement by a variety of actors, which creates instability in cyberspace and increases the chances of miscalculation. Defenders find the competitor's code on their network and do not know the purpose it is there for. This is destabilizing and dangerous. These countries argue that these types of activities are permitted under the international law. Whether they are and whether they fit within the emerging UN norms has not been fully analyzed. In any case, we need rules of engagement, including notification requirements for third-party countries where such activities may occur or transit. Thank you, Bruce. I also like that you kind of broadened the conversation quite a bit with bringing in some of those very important points. Uh, Haley, uh, you're next. Um, Estonia's interest and urgency to get cyber norms right was informed by the 2007 cyber attacks on Estonia and also served, I think, as an important wake-up call for the global community. How far have you come since then? Well, I think we uh, are uh, really far from the moment in 2007 when we in Estonia were wondering why there are no international political mechanisms for raising the significant cyber attacks, why there is no consultation mechanism in any other, um, international organization to speak about cybersecurity. So in that sense, I can say that um, we really um, uh, started to raise those issues in all international organizations. Um, we discussed with um, all our allies bilaterally. And I'm very glad that right now I can say that the um, class is half full. So we have many venues and forums in um, international organizations, uh, in regional organizations, in the UN, in EU, NATO, Council of Europe, uh, OSCE, so on, uh, all of them are dedicated to cybersecurity. So basically we can say that um, cyberspace is not a wild west anymore. So we have a mainstream the understanding that international law applies and gives rules for state behavior. Uh, we have the 11 um, norms um, uh, worked in the UN first committee uh, so I think that uh, right now we can confidently say that um, the framework is there for responsible state behavior. And um, uh, the next uh, step would be just to implement this framework. Of course, implementation always um, is um, taking some time and the expectations of the countries are also varying. And um, there are also different um, impediments uh, like um, uh, lack of capacity in some cases. Uh, and sometimes uh, the countries are having a very varying levels of uh, cyber maturity. But I think that uh, we have to continue all the international efforts to implement the normative framework as we have uh, developed this in the, uh, in the UN and in different regional fora. So um, when we talk about the framework specifically is that um, I think uh, the most important elements here um, is international law and uh, implementation of um, the understanding that the existing international law applies in cyberspace. So 
and certainly Estonia has done um, many efforts in this front. So we have uh, uh, trained uh, many of our colleagues in allies and also in uh, partner countries. There is the process called Tallinn Manual um, number three now on the way and so on. So on the norms of responsible state behavior, um, I think it's important that we get uh, the implementation going now in a uh, UN framework and the program of action uh, seems to be one of the very good uh, ways to do it. And on the regional confidence building measures, certainly we all work on those uh, and implement those measures. In uh, our European region, we are working in the OSCE in order to implement the uh, uh, confidence building measures. And I think this kind of capacity building efforts uh, that all the European nations are doing also outside the European Union is, is important for all of us. So. Thank you, Hilly. I, I think you, put, you, you uh, touched on many, many points that we need to discuss a little bit further uh, on implementations, which we'll, we'll do later down the line. But I think also the notion of, of uh, that you called mainstreaming that I actually haven't heard before uh, in this particular context where, where you brought up this uh, the, the, those issue of cyber uh, in the Security Council, right, which I think is an important part of these efforts uh, uh, to get things mainstreamed and, and, and socialized or things in, in, in a broader community than, than, the, than the expert uh, discussions within the UN. Um, John, um, Germany has been a strong advocate of the UN cyber norms process as well. Uh, but disinformation fake news uh, plagued the recent Bundestag elections. Um, John, what does this tell us about the state of cyber norms from your point of view? Well, from Germany's point of view, we find that we already have quite a strong framework in place. Um, we have an international consensus um, that only very few countries don't share. And this consensus says that international law applies fully to cyberspace. We have um, the evolving a framework for responsible state behavior, which has been um, developed inside the United Nations. And we have excellent guidelines that tell us how international law is supposed to be implemented in practice when it comes to cyberspace, like the Italian manual, which um, Ambassador Haley just mentioned. So we find that the, the normative basis is already very strong. But what we also see at the same time is that there's an immense implementation gap because the norms which we have all agreed on are not being adhered to by, by many state actors. And we've just seen this recently, you just mentioned this um, during the German election campaign, when we've seen um, um, a very serious hack and disinformation campaign, uh, which we attributed to Russia um, just a month ago. And um, we, we really saw this campaign as a, as a breach of our sovereignty and uh, as a real attack on our um, highly sensitive democratic processes. So these kind of incidents really show us that um, although we have norms, they're not really being respected. And, um, um, and, and in these instances, we find it very important to actually call out this kind of malicious behavior in cyberspace in a public way. That is why attributions um, are so important because we need to make sure that international law is not being eroded by malicious cyber actors. And when we talk about implementation, we must say that there are also encouraging examples, like, for example, the confidence building measures, which we have agreed on inside the OECE, and which were used, for example, by the United States earlier this year um, in the context um, of a major cyber incident where we actually used existing confidence building measures of information exchange between partners um, to keep us informed of this major cyber incident. So there are very encouraging um, examples which show us that implementation of cyber norms is possible. Th thank you, John, for, for bringing up those important uh, positive examples. But I think let's let's talk a little bit more about the implementation and what you call the the implementation gap. Can, how can we how can this uh, to move forward in this in this imp very important next phase of the uh, cyber norms uh, and implementation discussion? Um, Haley, um, what's the role of cyber diplomacy in the implementation of cyber norms and um, again, thinking about Estonia, um, are there any particular lessons learned from your country's digital transformation that are relevant to, to norms implementation? Well, as a, an early digitalizer, I think Estonia has uh, also uh, got its um, uh, first uh, test in terms of uh, cyber uh, campaign against us uh, quite early. So, uh, But um, um, as you ask about the role of cyber diplomats, I think the uh, good uh, maybe 
comparison uh, of cyber diplomats would be with translators. So we would be the ones translating um, the cyber community, the technical community, the critical infrastructure protection community to other diplomats in the world and also talking to other nations in the world. So and making sure that um, that we are trying to put uh, issues of cybersecurity into a more strategic context because uh, clearly we are not talking here about some technical matters but the matters of um, peace war and conflict which are uh, national security issues and foreign policy issues so and um, and i think the important notion is also that um, since cyberspace is a dual use domain uh, we have to also keep in mind all the other attributes of cyberspace so it's it cannot be just a militarized uh, zone uh, where we talk about um, cyber attacks, but we also are all relying on our digital economies. We also have to uh, keep up human rights and privacy and all the other important notions that we keep uh, here in European Union and in Europe, uh, in other in other parts of the world. So, and and therefore, um, I think the diplomats are the ones balancing um, the understanding of what is um, good for cyberspace and what kind of vision of cyberspace we want in the future. So. And, um, and Estonia has been, uh, I think, uh, quite well in th that balancing um, exercise because uh, I think we are quite cyber, cyber secure uh, in terms of critical infrastructure protection and everything what uh, the country needs to do in order to protect itself. But at the same time, I think we are leading a country in the world in terms of um, internet freedom together with Iceland. So and um, and so it has been, uh, of course, an effort of the whole nation and the national cybersecurity strategies uh, have been always um, uh, maturing and, and making sure that our ecosystem uh, continues to develop. Um, and of course, uh, as you also did touch the open the issue of the Security Council, again, we as the diplomats, we need to be translators here because there is a, a broader body of uh, diplomacy out there. Um, and, and we, the cyber diplomats, also need to explain to uh, Security Council uh, members, uh, the other diplomats, uh, what, we, what we mean about, uh, when we talk about cyber stability, or when we talk about the norms of state behavior and so on. And, and I hope we Estonians can, well, ha had um, done some um, good work there with the Security Council mainstreaming because um, I think the um, two events at the Security Council that we organized uh, were very, very well received and uh, enjoyed wide participation uh, also outside of the Security Council by, by many UN members. Thank you, Heli. That, that was super interesting. Um, but yeah, he, you, you brought up kind of like the notion of mechanisms to kind of like drive coordination and implementation, uh, but also think thinking about some of the challenges that are out there when it comes to norms in implement implementation or the broader digital transformation, particularly with the perspective on the Global South. What, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you, Andreas. Um, because you mentioned the Global South, um, I just want to start by also saying a bit something about, about exactly what that means. So within the cyber context, um, there is an emerging appreciation, I'll use that word again, that um, countries of the global south bring a different perspective to these discussions. But that also takes place within um, something that we don't talk about a lot within the cyber context, which is South-South cooperation, which is, which is something that's existed for a number of years within the UN institution and it refers to the technical cooperation among developing countries in the global south. So it, it came up as a tool for states, international organizations, private sector to collaborate and share knowledge um, across a wide variety of areas, agriculture, human rights, climate change, etc. And in 2018, um, the UN Secretary General actually said that um, the 2030 SDGs could not be achieved without the ideas, the energy and the tremendous ingenuity of the countries of the global south. But having said that, they aren't the same. So you will find um, antagonists as well in the global south. So that is not something that we can totally rule out. However, um, there is something new that they do bring to the discussions. And it's this idea of the international cybersecurity and development nexus. 
um, that they are bringing to the discussions. And because of this, there are some implementation gaps that have started to, to appear. And one of them is um, there isn't a very vibrant civil society, um, unlike in, in the global north, um, that can really serve to amplify some of the ideas that are coming out of the global south countries. For instance, if you look at um, what the non-aligned movement submitted as a working paper to the open-ended working group, most of those ideas ended up going into the chair's um, summary. Um, because they didn't enjoy a lot of consensus. Uh, points such as um, the, the importance of avoiding undue restrictions, including unilateral coercive measures um, for the peaceful use of ICTs. That is a point that did not enjoy consensus. However, the unilateral measures that um, some countries take um, in the cyber realm are becoming an, a, an issue for a lot of countries in the global south. And so without that vibrant civil society, ideas like that are not being amplified enough for us to actually start making headway. Um, but the other thing is also there isn't a, a, a real model for multi-stakeholder cooperation that, that really benefits countries of the global south. And so we are really looking to see where what kind of models are going to work so that every country countries that are new to the discussions and countries that have been in it for a while but still need a lot of capacity building can actually start engaging with some of those non-state multi-stakeholder groups that hold a lot of information capacity and actually influence the, the discussions to a certain extent. Thank you. I think what comes clearly out kind of like the different needs and, and, and of, of, of regional aspects that, that need to be addressed here. So I think that was, was super interesting. Thank you, Mudiehi. Um, uh, Bruce, uh, continuing with the uh, um, theme on the Global South, uh, you and the Observer Research Foundation of uh, America are leading a multi-year, multi-region uh, Global South policy dialogue. Are there any particular, you know, takeaways from the meetings when it comes to uh, implementation? Thank you uh, so much, and, and Mogie has been uh, participating in that in that dialogue with us. Uh, so under the sponsorship of the government of the Netherlands, ORF America is conducting a series of regional cyber dialogues in the Global South. We've hosted four dialogues so far, including in Singapore, uh, South Africa, and we will soon host them in uh, Jordan and Chile. Uh, so far, the dialogues have been virtual, but we hope next year we'll, we'll be able to convene in person. The topics vary from region to region, depending on local priorities, but we always talk about norms and their implementation, we have also talked about cybercrime, data protection, and disinformation. So far, I would say there are three takeaways. First, the UN norms are not at the top of the cyber agenda for countries in the global south. As I mentioned, there is concern about being drawn into a conflict, either diplomatic or cyber, between competing major powers when a cyber conflict is being conducted against assets on your local network. So they want the major powers to formally agree on the rules of state behavior and then to follow those rules. Second, cybercrime, including ransomware, is a big concern. One of the ways we are trying to assist in this domain is to create stronger regional networks so countries can work together to combat cybercrime. This is difficult and regional coordination is challenging. Third, there's continuing concern about the power of large U.S. platform companies and their control over information. The good news here is that the companies are now under scrutiny in America, and I believe they will have to moderate their behavior in the coming years. Underlying all these concerns is a lack of cyber policy capacity. There is a global shortage of cyber policy capacity, but if you are a small developing country, it is very difficult to address even all your domestic cybersecurity issues, not to mention the complexities of international cyber law. Thank you, Bruce. And I think you gave a, a very good uh, kind of keyword here that I want to carry on uh, to Alina about, you know, uh, major power competition and how that affects uh, some of the or affects some of the regional challenges in enormous implementations, you know, broader geopolitical dynamics, but also potentially national conflicts. And um, wh what's your view on that, Alina? Yeah, well, as uh, as you and Bruce have just pointed out, the challenges are numerous. Where do I begin? Right. Um, but let me just again highlight three. Uh, first, the digital divide is a very real challenge. Uh, within each country, there are disparities in access, 
literacy and infrastructure in urban and rural areas, but also between women and men. And there are gaps among the 10 very diverse ASEAN member states. If you look at the ITU's Global Cybersecurity Index, you'll see that the countries are ranked variously from top five all the way into the 100s. Um, and the Philippines, in their statement to the OEWG, highlighted the importance of capacity building in this effort. And this position is echoed throughout the region as reflected in ASEAN statements. Second, while there is agreement among all the 10 ASEAN member states on the importance of cyberspace for development and economic growth, as um, Moni also alluded to, there are also foundational barriers such as language, um, as well as competing priorities for overwhelmed and under-resourced governments. These now span hybrid challenges such as the ongoing pandemic set against an even greater demand for all things digital and more conventional risks, as you pointed out, Andrea, such as the very difficult political contest and crisis in Myanmar. Third, as the US and China seem bent on technologically decoupling, the concern in a digitalizing Southeast Asia, which has become a bit of a hub for tech behemoths from both China and the US, um, and whose networks, cloud and systems are outfitted by both Chinese and American vendors, the concern is that the region will be vulnerable to being shut out from the technology of one if it decides to go with the other, or that it will be caught in the crosshairs of cyber conflict brought on by geopolitical Russia, which we're already being be, uh, beginning to see right now. Thank you, Lena. Very, very, very interesting and fascinating. Uh, John, how can cyber diplomacy support the digital transformation and strengthen normal implementation? Um, are there any particular examples of cybersecurity capacity building uh, project that, that can il illustrate this and that Germany is involved in? Um, yes, we believe that um, cyber capacity building can make a very important contribution, both in strengthening worldwide resilience against cyber attacks but also in closing the digital divide, which has been mentioned a couple of times and during our discussions already. And we work together with partners in a number of countries to strengthen capacity building. I'd just like to mention two concrete examples. Um, one is a project implemented by EU CyberNet um, in the Caribbean, uh, namely in uh, the Dominican Republic, where EU CyberNet is building a regional center for cyber stability in order to really strengthen that particular region's ability to respond to malicious cyber activities and to, to strengthen its own cyber resilience. Um, we've also started cooperation with um, um, an NGO um, called ICT for Peace. And um, ICT for Peace is going to implement a project for us um, in offering um, cyber diplomacy training for diplomats in Southern Africa in order to really empower um, these countries to participate more actively in um, multilateral processes dealing um, with building cyber norms. So these are just two concrete examples how we can make a difference um, by really using cyber capacity building as an active tool. And I think it's very important that like-minded countries get together and build coalitions in order to take these issues forward because there are states which offer cyber capacity building on their own terms and um, and which actually use this as a tool in order to control other states. So it's very important that like-minded countries get together and make sure that we build um, cyber structures that really enhance access and transparency and stability for all. Thank you, John. This uh, was, was very clear. I do appreciate those, those clear thoughts. Um, as we all can see, um, time is going quite very quickly on, the, by, on this panel. And so as, as we are wrapping up, I'd like to invite our panelists to make some short final comments on concrete actions that should be taken on how or how they see the future of the UN processes moving forward to, to build better firewalls and firebreaks to, to stay with the, the theme of, of, this, of this panel. Um, Bruce, can, can you please go first? Sure. Th <clears throat> thank you, Andreas. Indeed, uh, I, I must say I forgot to mention that Elena is also participating in our regional dialogue. So we have good representation here on this in this panel. So I think three things, uh, governments need to formalize the rules for state conduct in cyberspace and abide by them. We can't continue to have a free for all in cyberspace. It's where we live and work right now. It's like having rival gangs fighting each other in the public market or, and in the schoolyard. 
Second, we must continue to build, work to build capacity, particularly cyber policy capacity in the global south. I think we've talked about that quite a bit on this uh, panel so that countries can have a whole of nation approach that includes industry, academia, and civil society. We need more people. Finally, for industry, you need to make your products more secure with security turned on by default when you ship it. We are still seeing software and hardware being installed in critical infrastructures like pipelines and hospitals where the default password is admin or password. This is unacceptable. These products need to be secure, secure out of the box, and equally important, they have to be updatable remotely and securely. This costs money, but not doing it is going to cost a lot more. Thank you, Bruce, and also for bringing the, the industry. I think we should not forget this very important player if we want to get norms implementation right. Alina, turning turning over to you. Yes, uh, I think there's a real opportunity for Global South countries uh, to exchange experiences among themselves. Within the ASEAN region, there are existing principles and norms of practice related to ICTs that actually predate the 11 GGE norms. These include the ASEAN CERT incident drill that has been ongoing since 2006. There's also the 2015 um, ASEAN Regional Forum Work Plan on Security of and in the Use of ICTs that had among its objectives the promotion of confidence building measures in the ICT environment and practical cooperation to protect critical infrastructure uh, and critical information infrastructure. More broadly, I think non-cyber related norms of responsible state behavior, such as the 1967 ASEAN Treaty on Amity and Cooperation, as well as the 10 principles of the Asian African Conference or the Bandung Conference of 1955 can easily be transposed to and given new life in the cyber realm. Now, I'm not completely naive and idealistic. There are some real hurdles to get over, as I outlined earlier. But countries in the global south shouldn't feel hobbled to at least speak out and contribute intellectually to some of the ongoing debates on cyber norms, even international law, just because they're not cyber powers. This is already being done, I know, maybe not always appreciated by all, but it's important that Global South countries have an equal say and representation, especially when their populations are not only the world's majority, but also form the largest potential markets for technology producers. Germany's first priority would be to close the implementation gap with regard to existing cyber norms. That's why we are very much supporting the idea of working out a program of action for um, responsible state behavior within the United Nations as a first step. Um, our second priority would be to make sure that malicious cyber actors can be held accountable by every state that is affected by malicious cyber activity. That's why we would support creating an independent body, building situational awareness on cyber situations in order to really allow every country um, to make its case when it's being affected by malicious cyber activity. And the third priority would be to take forward cyber capacity building via cross-regional alliances. Th thank you, John. Um, I know we're coming close to the end, but I want to quickly ask you, you know, the, the program of action came up a few times. Can you give us some additional background kind of where, where, where the, the French proposal currently is at? Um, this is a, a proposal that has been tabled by France together with Egypt. And um, it's a proposal which has found um, 53 co-sponsors um, at this point. So it, it has really has found um, um, a lot of resonance within um, the UN community. And at this point, the co-sponsors are discussing how to best take this forward. Um, should we take the program of action forward as part of the open-ended working group, um, as part of that framework which is already established? Or would it be more beneficial to actually start off an independent process and to negotiate such a program of action? So at this point, we are really very much in a consultative phase and uh, we're hoping to start a formal, formally working out that program very soon. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Modi, what, what are your, 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 your final comments here? Thanks, Andreas. I have quite a number, but I'll just limit myself to three. So the first one is something that Elena mentioned about the fact that um, cyber um, is one of and does not replace um, existing challenges that member states face. And so um, I would like to see more initiatives um, like being done by my own organization, UNIDEAR, on nexus papers. So we've got gender and cyber nexus paper in nuclear and cyber nexus paper. 
and a development and cyber nexus paper to help um, developing countries and countries of the global south to start seeing how it all plays together and initiatives like um, Ambassador Helly's having those Security Council open debates are also very useful and I would like to see more of those. And then the secondly is has to do with the multi-stakeholder consultations or the multi-stakeholder engagements. I would like to see more of those non-state um, industry uh, private sector avail themselves to Global South platforms to have engagements with um, developing countries that aren't that don't have the capacity to go down to California um, or to to expend resources um, to be in some of the bigger capitals where these entities are based. And then the last one is on capacity building, and John alluded to it. Um, Capacity, cyber capacity building should not be um, conditional um, and it should really adhere to the principles that have been outlined in both consensus reports of the open ended working group and the GGE beyond beyond being a member state of the UN and being signatory of um, the foundational UN conventions. There really shouldn't be any other conditions on cyber capacity building. I think uh, I can agree with everything which was said and maybe just highlight that, yes, I think implementation is a key. And we also hope that the program of action will be uh, the mechanism in the United Nations First Committee that we can all use for, for the better implementation. Secondly, we also have to make sure that we produce consequences for the malicious actors. Uh, so the, this kind of enforcement of norms um, and um, Deterrence measures are important as well because uh, I think the, this goes together. These two go together when we want to actually stop the um, serious attacks. And the third issue um, is um, quite urgent. We actually lack cyber experts uh, in um, uh, in big uh, numbers because in I think in the in the last European Union cyber strategy, the estimation is that we lack 300 to 400 thousand cyber experts in Europe. In the US, the number was half a million and globally, I think it's two million. So I think this is this is a very serious impediment for our efforts. So we have to start really thinking of how we step up training and education in this field. Thank you Haley, so much. I think this has been a fascinating and wide ranging conversation. And I think also shows that we have come a, a very long, a, far, a long way so far, but there is also quite a few difficult steps ahead that need to be solved, which makes this space uh, interesting and, and uh, you know, of, of course not boring. So I think given given all the things that need to be, need to be done here, we talked about capacity building, we talk, talked about the implementation gap, certainly an important kind of like phrase to, to remember that, that we need to address, but also shortage of experts. Um, Global South and emphasizing, amplifying uh, those voices are important here as well. So I'm kind of looking forward to the next iteration of this conversation, maybe within a year. Um, I think this concludes the panel. I would like to thank the panelists for their insightful remarks and everyone in the audience for joining us today. Uh, please enjoy uh, the rest of sci-fi and goodbye. Mm -hmm.